Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. For most of my time at the Oregonian, I was on the investigative team. And after having spent 16 years in the daily newspaper, I had enormous respect for the people I worked with. But when I walked, it was really an effort to say, I think there's a better way to cover the things that really matter to people in Portland. I felt that to get to the inflection point that had led me to write it about a state that had been in a crisis, I had to tell the state's story too. So that was really my goal, was to tell two life stories, you know, one of them calls and one was Oregon's. All right, folks, this week, I am very excited to bring you an interview with Brent Walth. Um, Brent Walth is a longtime Oregon journalist uh, who's worked for the Oregonian. He's worked for Willamette Week. He won numerous awards in his career as a journalist, uh, including five times he won the Bruce Bayer Award, which is Oregon's top reporting prize. He won the Gerald Loeb Award, nation's top honor for business and financial reporting. And he also won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, he won that award in 2001 for his reporting exposing, uh, he describes this in the episode, um, it was at the time called Immigration and Naturalization Service, and um, they were doing some horrific things that he exposed with a, a team of journalists from the Oregonian. Um, but most importantly, in my opinion, or at least for the purposes of this podcast, he's also, also the author of uh, a really incredible book. In fact, my favorite book written about Oregon, it's called Fire at Eden's Gate. Um, he wrote it many years ago when he was a, a young young man. We talk about that on the podcast as well. And it's a biography of Tom McCall. And Tom McCall is, in my opinion, I say this in the podcast, the greatest Oregonian um, who ever lived. Um, certainly, I think the greatest governor um, who ever served and someone who I think's impact on the state is still deeply felt. Uh, Tom McCall still gets quoted all the time by politicians in Oregon. Um, and his this, the centerpieces of his legacy are still intact, which again is something we chat about. Um, but it's also, it's also just an incredible story. It's a really interesting story. Tom McCall was an odd, eccentric, um, charismatic, commanding, uh, contradictory guy. Uh, unlike, I would say, anybody, at least on the political scene in Oregon, there's really no comparison. There's nobody who's quite like him. Um, and we talk about who, what he was like as a person. Um, and we also talk about his his legacy, his impact, what he actually did for the state. Uh, and Brent is literally the the perfect person to talk to about this because he he wrote the book on Tom McCall. Um, I, uh, this is this is the book that I buy for all the all the people who work in my office, interns and staff. Um, because I think it is sort of like a good, you have to understand where Oregon's been um, to understand today's political context. And I think this book does a really good job of describing where Oregon's been through the lens of Tom McCall. Um, so a couple things to look for as we're, uh, as we're talking through uh, Tom McCall and his impact. Right now in Oregon, there's a big debate about housing and there's a big debate about development. There's this conversation about the CHIPS Act uh, and how Oregon can access some of those federal dollars. And, centered in, and centered in those conversations is land use planning, uh, sometimes referred to as Senate Bill 100. That's the, that was the, the number of the bill when it was originally passed, when Tom McCall signed it. Um, we allude to Hector McPherson in this episode, who was a state legislator uh, at the time who helped pioneer this new policy. Um, the reason why I really wanted to talk to Brent was because I think over the next year or two, um, part of Tom McCall's legacy, in particular, the land use planning aspect is going to be at the center of the public policy debates about how we want Oregon to look in the next decade or two or three or 10. Um, and so I think it was, I just thought it was really valid. I thought it, I hoped it would be valuable for you all and particularly younger listeners who are less familiar with Tom McCall to hear a little bit about who the guy was that helped pioneer this and ultimately prevented it from being taken away, which is my favorite, my favorite part of the podcast. My favorite part of the book is when we talk about the end of Tom McCall's life and how at the very end, when he is sick and in pain, uh, he gives the last of himself to protecting his vision for the state um, and fending off what was called Measure 6 at the time, which tried to repeal land use planning. It was the last major challenge, I think, of um, the idea. So anyway, uh, I could talk about this forever. Brent was incredibly generous with his time. Even after the, the podcast ended, we kept talking for almost another hour. 
um, because he's got so much insight and and so many great stories from these giants of Oregon history. We talk about Tom McCall, we talk about Bob Straub, we talk, talk about Vic Atia, Mark Hatfield, um, Bob Packwood. Uh, all these folks were interacting at the same time on uh, the political scene in Oregon, and all of them have had a huge impact on the state we live in today. So I will stop rambling. I'll let you uh, get into the interview with Brent Walth, and uh, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you back here next week. Thanks, everyone. The lawyers of Harang Long PC have represented clients in Oregon's political and policymaking arenas for decades. We have worked on some of the most consequential public policy matters in modern Oregon history for both public and private sector clients. Our lawyers combine strategic savvy with technical expertise to navigate the legal, political, and governmental landscape in pursuit of our clients' goals. To learn more about how Harang Long can help you achieve your goals, go to harang.com. That's H-A-R-R-A-N-G dot com. All right, Brent Walth, thanks for coming on the podcast. You bet I'm thrilled to be here. So uh, we're going to talk a lot today about Tom McCall and Fire at Eden's Gate and uh, your experience writing that book and Tom McCall's legacy. Um, but you also are notorious, not just for writing this book, but as a journalist in Oregon. Um, and I think it was two, in 2001, I think in 2000, you were a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And then in 2001, you and a team of reporters were awarded the Pulitzer Prize for some reporting on the U.S. immigration system. Um, can you give us a little snapshot about, I guess, both? What was the 2000 um, uh, story or stories? And then what was the reporting in 2001? Yes, uh, in 2000, uh, Alex Pulaski and I, uh, we were reporters for the Oregonian, and we were writing a story about uh, the efforts of the federal government to reduce the amount of pesticides that show up most often in children's food. Congress had passed a law three years earlier hmm. uh, intended to reduce the amounts of pesticide, and so we decided to examine to see how effective the law was. We focused on a particular pesticide, the most common one used in the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> it was a pesticide used on apples. And what we discovered was that the law had largely been delayed by lobbyists, uh, lobbying from the agricultural industry. Hmm. And uh, uh, it really showed how difficult it was to actually put into place regulations designed to help children. And that was an explanatory story uh, series. And that was the finalist. So. And is that uh, is that Alex Pulaski, the same Alex who works at the School Boards Association now? It is the same. Yes. <laughs> I figured it must be. Um, and so then in 2001, you were awarded the prize. Um, what was the, I believe it said it was about the U.S. immigration system. What were you covering in 2001? That's right. Um, <clears throat> there were three, there were four of us all together, Kim Christensen, Rich Reed, and Julie Sullivan. And our job was to understand <clears throat> uh, the ways in which the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which was what the agency was called at the time, was uh, exercising power beyond its authority and really, in many ways, abusing its power, hmm. um, not only toward people who were not citizens or did not have the right documentation at the time, but at times, American citizens who were targeted in, by what really was a racist system, um, who sometimes were put in jail for weeks at a time on the slim allegation that they uh, didn't have citizenship. Uh, we saw families broken up. You know, today, uh, um, the idea of people uh, called dreamers, uh, mm -hmm. children who were brought here when they were young <clears throat> and and by their parents and couldn't get citizenship. We saw uh, the effects of that 20 years ago, and we're writing about that. Um, this, the INS essentially maintained what was a, a, a secret prison system where they had as many as 20,000 detainees all over the country. Wow. Usually what they would do is they would rent out jails, uh, jail beds in, in county jails. <clears throat> and the jail, the counties would agree never to divulge the names of the prisoners they were keeping on behalf of the INS. So family members couldn't find their loved ones. Oh, my God. Uh, and if they ever did, the INS would just pick up and move them to someplace else. Um, it was quite, uh, quite a travesty. <clears throat> we spent a long time, wrote about six really in-depth pieces. And uh, we were lucky enough to be honored. That's really cool. 
And then, and so, so now you're a professor at the U of O, but so did you write for the Oregonian and Willamette week? What was your, who did you, which outlets did you work for before you became a journalism professor? I worked for uh, the Register Guard for almost five years. I was the state capital reporter. I went to work then for the Oregonian, started off as their Washington DC correspondent. I came back um, uh, and covered business for a little while and environmental issues. But for my most of my time at the Oregonian, I was on the investigative team. And in 2011, <clears throat> I quit the Oregonian and I walked across the street and took over as managing editor at Willamette Week. I I, I skipped something. I had been at Willamette Week before I was at the Register Guard. But um, actually, my earliest job I should have mentioned was there as a reporter. So going back as managing editor was like going home again. And after having spent, spent 16 years in the daily newspaper. I had enormous respect for the people I worked with and uh, the prior editors. Uh, but when I walked, it was really an effort to say, uh, I think there's a better way to cover the things that really matter to people in Portland. And that's what we tried to do. When I, and that's what Willamette Week has always tried to do. That's what I tried to do as the managing editor there. That's cool. We have uh, we did a podcast a few weeks ago with Nigel talking about the Goldschmidt story and how yeah. Willamette Week has a very interesting place in the Oregon journalism ecosystem. Um, right. So so what years were you at Willamette Week before you went to U of O? I joined Willamette Week in um, <clears throat> May of 2011 and I left in the summer of 2015 in anticipation of going. So uh, I was there for four years. And um, you know, among the stories we did were an investigation of uh, the sitting governor, John Kitzhaber, and mm -hmm. the conflicts of interest that his fiance uh, or a partner um, were creating for him. And those stories eventually led to his resignation right after his reelection. And so I was in, we were there in the midst of that. So wild, wild times uh, <laughs> in, in your tenure. Um, so I think I want to transition now to to this book. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see I'm holding up uh, Fire at Eden's Gate. Um, just as a level setting here, where in your career were you when you wrote this book? Oh, <clears throat> very, very, very early on. Uh, in fact, <laughs> it re reminds me, I, in, you're asking me about kind of my resume. There was, a, there was even another paper I left out. My very first job out of college was um, for a very small daily a paper called the Daily Journal of Commerce, and a lot of people know it's still around. Um, and I was lucky enough to get to be the legislative correspondent. They never had one before. Hmm. So my first job out of college was as, at 23 years old, I was covering the Oregon legislation. And uh, uh, it was that's all I really wanted to become, be was a political reporter. So I was really having a great time. And I got to know a lot of people, you know, uh, uh, Vera Katz, former mayor of Portland. She had just taken over as House Speaker. I got to know her very well. Wow. A lot of other people who went on in politics, Greg Walden, um, uh, John Kitzhaber was the Senate president. And it was really a learning experience of how the system worked. Um, but, night, the, but the year I was there, <clears throat> Oregon was just coming out of what was the, then the worst recession since the Depression. I mean, uh, People who did not live through it perhaps aren't aware of how devastating it was. It, mm -hmm. it forever changed the tenor and the fabric of the state. This recession was um, extraordinary. <clears throat> and as the Oregon started to emerge from it, people were saying, you know, that Tom McCall, who was governor you know, back in the 70s, back a decade ago, mm -hmm. he really was bad for Oregon. Mm -hmm. He really wasn't good, good for Oregon. And I heard the governor say that. I heard a lot of other people say it. And I just... It just didn't sound right to me. Uh, and I had grown up in, I grew up in Oregon. Um, McCall was, I remember McCall being governor. I mean, I, I was such a political nerd as a kid that I remember when he left the governorship thinking, boy, this is not going to be as fun anymore. <laughs> yeah. Without you know, being governor, I can, I recall that distinctly. So I had all these memories and that were, you know, mostly sort of, retold stories about what McCall had meant to Oregon in, in the years that he was governor. And let me place that for you, 1967 to 1975. <clears throat> so as I heard people talking about this, I thought, well, I should do a story or two or three 
about what McCall's legacy really was. Yeah. So maybe we could sort of fact check these claims that he was actually bad for Oregon. And uh, first thing I did was I went to Powell's uh, to go buy all the books about Tom McCall. I think that's where I bought your book. It's got the Powell's sticker. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, yeah, this was in April of 1986, and I think I was 24 or 25, and I was still working for this little daily, and I said, uh, I was just going to go buy all the books about him and read them all, and then, you know, uh, that'll that'll be a start, and what I realized was there were no books about him. Except for his book. Uh, right. He, McCall had, um, I won't say that he wrote a memoir, but he published a memoir. He, he talked into a microphone for several hours and the, his co-author basically transcribed it into a, a memoir and i think there and it was, while it was it was not really fact checked right like there's some things in there that are verifiably untrue <laughs> well they were verified that's right they they were uh they were verifiably part of mccall's memory at the time that he <laughs> he told those stories but you know his 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 co-author was you know not exactly challenging him on a lot of the facts either Sure. But it was a really entertaining book and it had tremendous insights into his thinking and, and the experiences, what it was like to go through those experiences as governor. And so I don't want to, it, it was very entertaining, but yes. it it was, it was for me, it was sort of a baseline of like, this is his story, but there were no other books. And <clears throat> being kind of, you know, naive, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just go write one. And uh, I often wish that when I had that idea, I just wish I'd kind of gone home and laid down until the feeling passed because it, <laughs> it was an enormous task. I had no idea what I was in for. I knew I was in over my head. Yeah. But I wanted to tell a story, not just about this one man, but I wanted to tell, I also wanted to write a biography of the state. Yeah. I felt that to get to the point, to, to the inflection point that, the, that had led me to write it about a state that had been in a crisis and how that stood in <clears throat> stark contrast to the leader that it had only a few years before, <clears throat> I felt I had to tell the state's story too. So that was really my goal, was to tell um, tell two life stories, you know, one when one calls and one, one was Oregon. So that's, that's a good, this is probably a good chance. I'll probably have mentioned this in the intro already, but like I, my personal opinion is I think Tom McCall is the greatest Oregonian of all time. I think he embodies the Oregon <laughs> spirit better than almost any historical figure that I can think of. Um, and I also think that every governor that came after him to varying degrees <laughs> have tried to to, to fit into the shoes of Tom McCall, either rhetorically or by policy. Many governors have quoted him in their speeches. And so my like thesis and the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because my thesis is Tom McCall still matters. And the story that you tell in this book is still relevant. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about why that is today. I think in this legislative session and in this context with housing being so prominent as an issue, I think Senate Bill 100 and land use planning and Tom McCall's vision of restrained growth versus, you know, like arguments on the other side about like, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But mm -hmm. I also think a lot of younger folks, and I'll use younger, um, maybe mm -hmm. more generously and say anybody under 40, um, they Tom McCall is he, he, he maybe like second or third hand they mm -hmm. like have read about or heard Tom McCall. And I don't think that there's like a contemporary figure who is like was like him in terms of just his personality his manner of speaking like his magnetism in front of a camera his weird sort of coalition of character traits so before we talk about the policy like how would you describe tom mccall as a person as a character like what was he like <clears throat> well i wish i'd met him and i hadn't i took on this book about three years after he had died mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, so everything I'm going to tell you, my impressions, are, you know, what I've seen through video and, and uh, heard through audio and, and the stories people have told. <clears throat> but as a person, he was always a commanding presence, even as a kid. <clears throat> he grew to be six and a half feet tall. <clears throat> he was <clears throat> eloquent. Um, he was he had mastered the the, the talent of being. Uh, his eloquence as a radio broadcaster and on television. 
He was an extraordinary writer, so his, his powerful words was always with him. But primarily, McCall never lost his sense <clears throat> that he was representing each individual Oregonian. And we hear this a lot from the rhetoric of politicians today. I think most of them are quite sincere. They didn't. They didn't have. They don't have what it was he had, mm -hmm. which came from a background of at one time enormous wealth, and the family basically lost it all. So he knew what it was like to be chauffeured to school in a limousine, and also to ride, you know, horseback mm -hmm. when, when his family uh, lived in, in Central Oregon and they had virtually nothing in terms of you know uh, money. He understood how that he had a personal legacy to carry forward. He had a family that was deeply involved in politics and public service. But he never lost that sense of human connection. The other thing about him that I think was remarkable was that he did not hide who he was. That's right. He was, uh, his emotions were out there. His heart was out there. Uh, even when it wasn't in his best political interest. <laughs> right. um, and I think, uh, it's a hard thing to do. And I think, I think, you know, you made the point that almost every governor has had to respond to his legacy. And I think that's right. Um, I know that many governors uh, wish they hadn't. Yeah. You know, didn't have to. Do. And even, you know, um, whether it's the press corps that put that question to, you know, to people running for governor or serving as governor, it, it implicitly, can you live up to McCall? Uh, he did change the what, what he changed the way we um, we look at the governorship and what we expect from the person in that office. Totally. And uh, uh, it's it's a difficult. It, in some ways, it's not particularly fair to the people who followed him because it's a difficult uh, legacy to live up to. What he was able to accomplish, what uh, the impact he had, also the way in which he ha he allowed Oregon to see itself in a new way. Mm -hmm. um, that raised expectations on public service and as you point out left a, a lasting legacy on the landscape so one of the one of the things i appreciate about your book is the the portrait of this man is is complicated and nuanced um tom mccall he's he's certainly a hero in this book i think i would imagine you might describe him as a heroic type of figure but his flaws as a human are also on display. Um, and when I say flaws, I'm thinking and flaws might be too strong of a word, but the man projected this extreme confidence and he was very, com as you say, commanding rhetorically, but he also suffered from like crippling self-consciousness and was, it, it, you know, like at the, they talk about this story at the end of the campaign, he could not finish the campaign on the campaign trail. Cause he was so stressed out. He couldn't, he couldn't ma imagine the thought of losing. He loses the tax reform ballot measure, which we'll hopefully talk about later. <laughs> and he, he says, I've got to resign. I can't do this. The, the people have rejected me. Like, how do you, what do you make of the contradictions of who he, of who he was? That's uh, that's exactly right. I think he was someone who, who um, understood that he, the role he played in, in public life, even before he ran for office. You know, he was he was not just a reporter. He was on radio and on television. He was a commentator, which means that he kind of uh, could take current events, whatever was happening that day or that week in Oregon, and help uh, viewers and listeners make sense of it. He understood that <clears throat> he came, he had a perspective that was sometimes controversial mm -hmm. and that people would often be unhappy with him. But at the, at the same time, he could not stand the thought that people didn't like him. Yeah. It's a very it's a, it, And so the story you tell about the governor's here is that's absolutely true. What happened? He was, uh, yeah. Well, his, his first, yeah, his first uh, race for governor uh, in 19... 66 he was running against the state treasurer democrat bob straub right and they, they they had a sense that mccall was ahead in the polls but they were afraid that he was going to do something or say <laughs> something that was because of his nerves basically yeah. and he became uh people who worked on the campaign with him told me that he would look at a poll and it might say you know 
McCall 54 straw 46, something like that. And he would want to know why 46% of the people didn't like him. Right? <laughs> as opposed to, you know, as if say we're winning, right? And what they did was the last four or five days of that campaign, they rented a hotel room and they, they sent him there and he didn't come back out again. And <laughs> Bob so Straub. Funny. <laughs> yes. And and uh Bob Straub told me, I think, and as well as other people who worked with Straub, who he was running against, said he basically disappeared, and that and he, that's what happened. And it was just such an effective, it was such an effective strategy. That four years later, when he was running for re-election, they and they did the same thing. The same thing. And, <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and you couldn't you couldn't get away with that today, you know. And um, but they also knew <clears throat> that what his great strengths were, were were also his vulnerabilities, which he spoke his mind, mm-hmm. and he showed his. And um, uh, that worked for him in that era, uh, especially when the news media working as it did, you know, uh, uh, today it would be a different story, probably, but it worked for him. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned Bob Straub. Uh, what, I, what I also love about the book is like Tom McCall, all the giants of the last sort of like I guess at this point, it's been like 50 or 70 years of Oregon history. He was interacting with and had complicated relationships with each of these people. Um, Bob Straub, probably central on that list. Although interestingly, by the end of the book, like Bob Straub and Tom were were rivals in some ways. They ran against each other twice. Um, Tom won both times. And then Bob becomes governor uh, by running after he's term limited the first time. And, I, you know, I think Floyd McKay called it the Bob and Tom show because they were, you know, going around the they were going around the state and they actually didn't disagree on a whole lot. They they were broadly aligned, at least on environmental environmental policy. And by the end, Bob Straub is sort of a defender of McCall's legacy. Um, yeah. And weirdly, I mean, Tom McCall's own party has kind of shifted. That'll, I guess, be my second question. But we, Bob Straub, Mark Hatfield, um, Atia, Packwood, Morse, they're all kind of in this. Maybe just give us a snapshot of like how did how did Tom McCall fit into that constellation of these major, major figures? What was his relationship like with these folks? Well, let's start with Straub. Straub had been a state senator, he'd been a Lane County Commissioner, and no one took him seriously as a contender for a statewide office. But he won the state treasurer's job at the same time that McCall moved up. He McCall ran. He gave up being a television, of course, uh, commentator and became secretary of state. And they they arrived at the same time, these two positions, statewide positions and, and state government. And um, the at the time, the state government was really run by what was called uh, the control board, which was the yeah. governor, the secretary of state and the state treasurer. That's right. And the governor at the time was a Republican, Mark Hatfield. That's right. And Hatfield found himself outvoted. By the Democrat and this fellow Republican a lot of times, um, which uh, Hatfield did not enjoy. And McCall's position was often that you know, he saw Straub as a political competitor for higher office, but he saw him as an ally uh, and a compatriot in the things that really mattered at the time. That was cleaning up the Willamette River. It was protecting uh, the right to public access to Oregon beaches. Mm-hmm. And uh and those were the two primary issues when they first ran. And uh, uh, so in many ways, they were in the business of sort of trying to top each other during that campaign or Oregonians benefited because the, every time one of them would say something, someone would say, well, I'll do this and I'll do this. And it was all for the benefit primarily of conservation, for protecting Oregon's livability. But Hatfield, um, Hatfield was sort of separate from that dynamic, right? Like McCall and, and Hatfield had an icier kind of relationship. Yeah, you know, it's often true in politics that the the people who are politically aligned are oftentimes uh, the most competitive with each other, um, in part because they, they're, they one is holding the stage that the other thinks that he should hold. Mm-hmm. Um, McCall had that feeling about Hatfield. Uh, you know, Hatfield came up as kind of a, uh, with a determination to, to pursue politics um, and, you know, never lost a race in his career uh, from the House, State House to the Senate, uh, Secretary of State and the Governor, and then, you know, Senate, U.S. Senate. 
McCall came in um, in some ways kind of laterally. He had been in broadcasting. He was in broadcasting and he, he understood the importance of making a bring the Republican Party in, in his views and in Hatfield's views more to the center. The Republican Party, for example, Hatfield and McCall first met when they were both working to fight for civil rights through the Republican, bring the Republican Party more towards civil rights in the 50s. Hatfield mm. had an excellent record on that. And McCall couldn't get past his jealousy that Hatfield was already governor, was already successful, and um, he struggled a lot with that. You know, I talked to Hatfield for this book, and, mm -hmm. and, and Hatfield was incredibly candid about his relationship with McCall. Um, and there are stories in the book that are tough about McCall, but there's a few that are also tough about Hatfield because they had a contentious relationship. Uh, you know, in the end, as Hatfield reminded me, you know, when McCall's funeral was held in the state capitol, it was it was Mark Hatfield who sat next to McCall's widow. Mm. And that sort of showed that they had this enduring respect, <clears throat> even though there was a sort of deep, deep competitiveness. That That's really, you know, that McCall demonstrated, Hatfield was actually pretty good at um, hiding it publicly. McCall was not. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, and Hatfield often got the better of him um, because he knew that McCall had a an emotional <clears throat> side. He could, he could get angry. He could you know sort of express himself in ways that you know Hatfield was very contained. You know, but uh, I have a funny story about Hatfield. I can tell it really quick. Yeah, yeah, please. I I I I I interviewed Hatfield at length. He was very generous with his time, and then um, I saw him about a month after the book came out. And he said, uh, young man, I've, I've, I've received a copy of your book. Oh, no. I said, Great. I said, have you read it? He said, well, I am in the process of reading it. But he said, not from beginning to end. And I said, no. He said, no. I picked up the book and I went straight to the index under H, Hatfield, <laughs> Mark. And I read those parts. It's a true story. And, he, and I started laughing because here was this U.S. senator, you know, of great esteem, who, who knowingly, you know, tongue in cheek was telling me, you know, the most important parts of this book were the ones about him. And I don't know of any other politician who would admit that. But, you know, he did. He did. Um, he did tell me I got it right. And that was the most important thing. So that's cool. Anyway, so the, that's, the a, that's a true story. The relationship you described between Hatfield and McCall sounds vaguely reminiscent of how the Atia McCall relationship was. Although maybe a T I think maybe a McCall might've not had quite as much respect for Atia because he was newer on the scene, younger. How would you classify their relationship? And Atia was kind to McCall even after McCall died. Right. I mean, he also stands up at the funeral and talks about his legacy and, and what he's done for Oregon. Yeah. Vic Atia had been a state Senator from Washington County and, um, it, and it's there were times in which where there was so much Democrat, uh, it, it, some, uh, the Democrats were so much control of the legislature. There were only six or seven Republicans in the Senate out of thirty. Right? There's there was a famous photograph of all six or seven of them trying to fit into a phone booth. You know? <laughs> and um, but McCall always saw always saw ha uh, Tia rather as someone who uh, Vic Tia, someone who was obstructing you know progress, and he didn't have much respect for him. The the and when uh, in, in, when McCall was leaving office because of term limits, Democrat Bob Straub, who had lost to McCall twice, Straub, I'm sorry, McCall, all but endorsed the Democrat as opposed to the fellow Republican. Uh, and of course, it was Atia who, when McCall tried to make a comeback in 1978, after being out for four years, it was Atia who beat McCall in the Republican primary. Mm hmm. It was a bitter situation for McCall. He never got over it. <clears throat> I will tell you that in talking to Atia, um, he was always incredibly gracious. And I think always a little hurt. He never could understand why McCall wasn't more accepting of him and more um, uh, why they weren't closer. And I saw uh, Atia not long before he died. And, and, and he remained to be very gracious even though McCall wasn't always that way toward him. So yeah. 
I I yeah. had the pleasure of getting to meet um, Vicati a few times before he passed away. He was a member of my fraternity at the U of O and was stayed in oh, yeah. really until he passed and was one of the kindest and most gracious people I ever got to meet. And and I was I was thinking about I mean let's talk about the Republican Party like. At the time, there seemed to be this pretty significant gap between where Tom McCall was in the party. Um, I think you describe him in the book as a liberal Republican uh, and where Atia stood in the party, which was this more sort of like, I guess you could say business friendly um, Republican. But by today's standards, I think both of them are a lot closer together than where maybe the mainstream of the party is today. Um, I'm curious kind of how how you think the McCall Atia era fits into the broader scope of the Republican Party. It's a really great question. You know, I do think that the party was starting to move to the right um, by the late 70s. Um, McCall had, of course, moved away from the Republican Party. He had been very critical of national Republicans, the president, Richard Nixon, the vice president, Spiro Agnew. Um, he did not uh you know uh hold back uh, when he had things harsh things to say about anybody from any party that he just disagreed with or who he felt weren't, weren't progressive enough you know, i may well have in the book called him a liberal republican i think he was you know in hindsight far more uh progressive i think progressive is a better definition for him yeah. you know as i look at as i look at it today right um <clears throat> But, you know, Vicky T was very much a, a Chamber of Commerce Republican, mm-hmm. sensitive to business needs, but also um, quite understanding of needs for human services and social services in the state. Atia had a, a terrible situation of making deep and serious cuts to the budget during the recession I talked about earlier. And um, uh, nobody won in that era. That was very difficult. Um, but yes, I, I think within by the time um, Atia left office in 1986, we were already seeing an extraordinary uh, right wing movement that had an impact on uh, state politics and the, the governor's race in 1990 and and, and on forward. And so it, the party shifted out from under a lot of the establishment Republicans in that way. So when when McCall was governor. Um, you know, he's he's the head of the Republican Party. He's the Republican Party standard bearer. He's the highest ranking Republican in the state. Um, was there dissatisfaction with him at the time from the Republican Party, or did that happen after he left office? Um, <clears throat> I don't remember widespread dissatisfaction. What there was uh, was widespread dissatis- dissatisfaction with him among a lot of the <clears throat> CEOs of major corporations in the state. And some of them were quite blunt and about McCall, um, because what well, what was he doing? He was asking their their mills to stop polluting. He was asking uh, their companies to stop turning, you know, farmland into subdivisions where it didn't make sense for them to go. <clears throat> uh, he was sending a message uh, that Oregon was putting conservation on equal footing with the with the economy, and uh, for a lot of these mostly old white men that didn't go over very well. Hmm. You know, the one thing we haven't talked about was yet was McCall's most famous statement. Uh, yes, you know, right. when he was trying to impress upon state that he was hoping to slow growth to a point where not slow, let me rephrase that, uh, control growth in a way that was reasonable and rational as opposed to, um, uh, Un, uh, unhinged growth is what a lot of places in Oregon were seeing. He believed it because he thought it was better for the economy mm-hmm. not to have sprawling subdivisions that were incredibly expensive to serve. He thought that it was pointless to destroy important you know, farmland uh, without thinking about what the trade-offs were. All of those considerations that became the heart of our land use system. And um, you know, that was a tough argument for many people uh, not just who are Republicans, but also, you know, um, but uh, for a lot of business leaders. So the message he sent was, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, he said, but he said, he said, know, Oregon, um, come, come visit Oregon. This is a state of excitement, but for heaven's sake, don't come here to live. <laughs> That's exactly right. 
And of course, the, he was blamed for slamming the doors on Oregon and shutting out people, but which is, of course, nonsense because Oregon started, continued to grow at, re at record rates. And as McCall explained himself years later, you know, what he was trying to say was, uh, we are not ready for the onslaught. We need to think about the future. It was one of the ways that Vicatia later on really got under McCall's skin. Mm -hmm. Vicatia, you know, you know it, 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 Governor T was one of the people who, when I first got interested in writing this book, was saying McCall was bad for Oregon. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, Atia tried to get McCall to take that statement back. And they actually had a, a, a media event yeah. at the Oregon California border. I actually used it to open the book where Atia thinks McCall is going to retract his statement and he's going to, you know, <laughs> apologize for having said this years earlier. And McCall turned it around and did just the opposite in front of the cameras in the world and said, you know, uh, that Oregon continued to even in the depths of a recession, a very painful one, the, the lowest point in the recession, the recession actually was uh, Oregon needed to hold its its place and continue to think about how to control growth, not stop it, not limit it, but be reasonable about how it works. I uh, I should have done a better job of bookmarking, but he, I kind of, oh, here we go. Uh, there's been a lot of bad mouthing about visit, but don't stay. McCall rumbled on it. It served its purpose. We were saying visit, but don't stay because Oregon queen bee, though she is, is not ready for the swarm. I'm simply saying McCall continued his voice lowering to a growl that Oregon is demure and lovely and it ought to play a little hard to get. Then barely pausing, he shot a quick impatient look at Atia, who's standing next to him at this press conference. <laughs> And then he says, and I think you'll all be just as sick as I am if you find it, if you find it is nothing but a hungry hussy throwing herself at every stinking smokestack that's offered, <laughs> which I, Tom McCall was such a gifted orator <laughs> that he could say something like that just off the cuff. Well, I, I'll tell you, that was probably not off the cuff. He would probably, he probably had that ready to, oh, to go. Prepared, that, prepared that, language, yeah. Yeah, but for but but you know, for his rhetoric, the use of alliteration <clears throat> or surprise su uh, surprising combinations of adjectives and nouns, you know, and verbs, he knew how to say something that would get people's attention. And yours as a writer, <clears throat> and he also knew he also knew how to you know uh, command the spotlight. And it's true. Uh, I I I describe that actually watching the raw footage of one of the TV stations. Let me come in and watch the raw footage of that event. Wow, and that's how I was able to describe it. And uh, no one remembers that Governor Tia was there at his own press event. What they remember is that McCall continued to stand up for Oregon in the darkest hours. And it was not only dark for Oregon; he he had terminal cancer and he knew it, and um, he uh, he understood what he was fighting for. So that's that's what I want to talk about next. I know we're we're going to come up on time here. Um, there's this is an incredible book and it's in part because of your writing, but in part, in part because it's a truly incredible story. Um, I think something we have to spend some time talking about is Senate bill 100, uh, which yeah. is also what, what we call today the land use planning system in Oregon. Um, and when, when, when you say thing, or when Atia said things like McCall was bad for Oregon, I think primarily what he's referring to is Senate bill 100 or the, the, the sort of like controlled growth that you're describing. Um, so I guess let's quickly like cover how did Senate bill come to be? How did this become law? And why did McCall kind of latch onto this as, as the center point of his legacy? There was a clear understanding, um, especially people who uh, 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 in the suburbs and in rural areas that <clears throat> farmland, open space was going to be quickly consumed by um, subdivisions, strip malls, highways, and that it had a social consequence, not only the loss of livelihood and loss of farmland, but if you trace back the, the causes of, of pollution in, in, a, in, a, in a polluted Willamette well River, it had to do with poor services. Uh, people didn't, uh, uh, communities didn't have a, a sewer system. The, the effluent went straight into the river. Um, or uh, 
the idea that we want to limit air pollution, then we shouldn't have people driving 20 miles out to a subdivision that it can, has, you know, it's what would they call leapfrog de subdivisions, you know, uh, uh, developments. And the idea was to build in a smart way. <clears throat> the idea actually came from um, a farmer who, who was also in the state Senate that <clears throat> there should be some, first of all, a requirement that there be zoning. Some counties didn't even have that. Mm. And then eventually uh, uh, the idea that every jurisdiction in Oregon should have a plan now called a comprehensive plan and have to follow it. And it didn't say you couldn't grow. It said you had to have a plan for growth. And that was the heart of it. And McCall understood that this was, that every, all of the other problems that he had dealt with, all the other th things that he saw putting pressure on the livability in Oregon, uh, traced back to smart growth. And this became the mechanism for that. Mm. And it was Senate Bill 100, 1973 three is when it passed and <clears throat> there was such a, a a serious effort to repeal it that you know on three different elections uh there were efforts to um um repeal the law and, and um all three went down to defeat including the one that mccall <clears throat> the, the one chance that that opponents really had to repeal bandage planning came at that that one moment I was describing, 1982, when McCall was dying and the state was at its lowest point in terms of a recession. And that's when you know McCall died, you know, fighting to protect that. And um today we it's been accepted as part of the fabric of the state. People may not still like it, but uh, and it's easy to point to places where it doesn't work as well as it should. But I would challenge folks um to compare what has happened in Oregon to other places um and it's still a model around the country in terms of ways to you know protect livability to common sense growth not to not to limit it not to stop it but just to be smart about it and that came from that one bill you're describing senate bill 100 um and then a, a lot of work in the years after that by many people to try to figure out how to make this work as well as possible my my favorite part of your book it's it's hard to read it's hard to read about the period from a call between um when he leaves office as governor and he dies because this is not a pretty he, he he's he's it, you can tell he's struggling he's struggling personally um he misses being governor uh yeah. he he's he's dealing with some some personal challenges with um i don't i don't think the word alcoholism is ever used but it it's alluded to the fact that he's he's drinking his staff cl claims that the drinking has made him i think fuzzy is the term that they use um he's also got a son who's navigating his own um pretty significant challenges so that part's that part's hard to read um but there's this crescendo before the end of the book where you're talking about measure 6 and like the framing, the framing is basically, like you said, this is the best chance that the sort of corporate interests have ever had to get rid of this thing that is a pain in their ass. And they raise a lot of money and they're running a competitive campaign and the polling makes it really clear. Voters are with them. I think at one point there's like a 26% lead in the poll to repeal land use planning. And you just get the sense that just McCall is just getting beat up. Like his legacy is being tarnished. This thing that he cares so deeply about this vision that he had for the state is at risk. Um, but then there's this, there's this other poll and I can't, maybe you can fill in the, the, the gaps here, but there's this other poll that says there's one person in the entire state who is a trusted messenger on the issue of land use planning, according to voters. And his name is Tom McCall. And so Tom McCall has terminal cancer that started in his spine and basically spreads everywhere. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll read a little quote and then you can fill in the gaps of the story. This is from, I can't remember where this is from. There's a video of it on YouTube that folks can find, but he's basically, this is one of his last public appearances where he's trying with everything he's got to defend his legacy. And this is just an excerpt from, uh, an excerpt from a longer, longer remarks. TV cameras were there by, by design. This is Tom McCall. You all know I have terminal cancer and I have a lot of it. But what you may not know is that the stress induces its spread and induces its activity. Stress may even bring it on. 
Yet stress is the fuel of the activist. And this activist loves Oregon more than he loves life. And I know I can't have both very long, but the trade-offs are all right with me. But if the legacy we helped give Oregon and which made it twinkle from afar, well, if it goes, then I guess I wouldn't want to live in Oregon anyhow. And he's using, he uses that kind of language to defend land use planning and defend his vision and the image of Oregon as this beautiful sort of haven. Um, and ultimately they win. The measure wins. Um, yeah, that's right. What's what's happening in McCall's life in these final weeks? Um, he's clearly mm -hmm. aware of what's what's of, of his health deteriorating, and he's made a conscious decision on how to use his time. That's exactly right. <clears throat> um, this came. Uh, you we were talking before. This is 1982. That same campaign where the go governor T is running for re-election, holds that event at the at the border, uh, and McCall was frail. Uh, he was in a lot of pain. Um, he knew his cancer was terminal. He had not made that public. Mm. No one heard that. I think anybody who saw him knew that it was he was quite sick. But you, you know, P, uh, uh, public figures didn't go out and say, "I'm dying of cancer." They didn't mm. do that. Politicians, political leaders, didn't do that. Um, but he knew that um, uh, he he wanted people to understand. The, the the gravity of how he saw this personally. And <clears throat> there's no question that that campaign turned around at that moment. And the reason I know that is that the, the pollster for that, for the opposition to this measure, you had measure six in 1982 was the measure, uh, told me that uh, they, they, they could see that McCall was still the, the most uh, revered figure in Oregon. Um, and, and how could he, you know, how, how could they you know, not use him? And uh, the event was was a press conference, actually. Mm. It was carried by every TV station. And then the audio, um, I don't know whether McCall re-recorded it, but his statement became uh, part of the advertising. Mm. And at that point, you know, the, the person who was the pollster told me, at that point, those numbers flipped. And there was there was no way that measure was going to pass, and all it took was McCall, uh, in a very deeply personal way, uh, with utmost honesty, saying this is what this means to Oregon. Mm -hmm. You know, and from to, to hear from Tom McCall that he would he wouldn't want to be in Oregon anyway. You know, it was it was it was incredibly powerful. I remember that when it happened, and. Uh, you know, when you're writing a book like that, you know, you um, I kept thinking over and over again, I, I I, can't all of the things that came together at the end of his life. You could not have made them up and have people believe it. But it's what happened. You know, and he um, he died, I think, just about two months after that election. So it, it was uh, it's emotional to read. I get choked up even talking about it now because it's such a it's such a beautiful it also is what make made him such a special and unique person. Like a lot of politicians at the end of their lives, particularly, I mean, what we don't talk about is Tom Moncal had a really embarrassing defeat when he ran for uh, governor a third time. He took his four years off and he came in second in the primary behind Atia. And, you know, he was frustrated and he ultimately leaves the Republican party, registers an ind and is an independent. A lot of times I'd say most politicians by the end of their career are, uh, retired, uh, living comfortably, um, maybe wandering in the limelight here and there. But what Tom McCall did as he's dying, and as you describe in the book, in, in legitimate pain, I mean, he's wincing when he walks, uh, like the, the cancer had really taken over his body. With his final breaths, <laughs> he's fighting for a ballot measure to, to go down to protect a legacy, um, which is just proof that for, you know, complicated guy, not a perfect guy, but he believed what he believed and he believed it deeply. Um, and here we are in 2023, decades and decades after he's been gone and the, the crown jewels of his legacy, public access to beaches, land use planning, the bottle bill, they all remain intact and they all remain not just intact, but I think sort of central to how we think of ourselves as a state central to our identity, what it means to be the state of Oregon. Um, and that's close to unmatched in the, in the pantheon of Oregon governors, I would say. You, you you captured it perfectly. That's exactly right. Um, 
you know, if I if I had you know, written this book even at the time, or now if you go back and look at it, you know, if these things didn't matter anymore, if they were history, you know, they're 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 with us. He is with us all of the time. And as he would, uh, was a lot of people pointed out, you know, McCall oftentimes embraced the ideas of other people, all of it, as well as, you know, um, came up with ideas on his own or with his staff. He didn't much care. He didn't much care um, you know, where the ideas came from as long as it, 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 it moved forward his ideal, his, his hope to protect the state's livability even when he wanted to work and grow and to prosper and knew it was inevitable, you know, how best to do that. And, um, you know, we are still living with that. We are still living, um, uh, I think, you know, in ways we should be grateful for is still part of the fabric of our state today. That's right. Uh, well, I know we're we're right at time, Brent. But before we uh, before we go, I have to. Uh, we talked about this before we started recording. But over your shoulder, um, there's a little piece of Oregon campaign memorabilia history. Can you describe? Yeah. For, can you describe for for listeners uh, what's leaning on your wall? Yeah, and uh, this is always in my office. Um, this is a campaign poster from uh, Tom Paul's re-election campaign. A lot of folks may remember or may not. But there was a very famous photographer in Oregon who used to capture all of the amazing beauty of the state, Ray Atkinson. Ray Atkinson and and yeah. Atkinson took, um, was it four, four, four or six versions of Okay, there's oh. four versions of the poster. Yeah, yeah or, or there may be, I don't know how many, but I have two of them. And this is a Clarks Mount Hood, and it says, um, keep Oregon, Oregon. Keep Tom McCall. And when he ran for a real election, um, that was it. That was the slogan. And I thought it really summed it up. And uh, it's a prized possession. It's so on. I love it. So totally. I've got I've got my own copies in, in my office and yeah. another another prized possession I have. You'll probably get a kick out of this. This was my grandmother's. Um, she's since passed, but um, she gave it to my dad and my dad has given it to me. It's, um, you know, the American Gothic, the like stern couple holding the pitchfork. Um, yeah, it's, it's a cross stitched cross stitch picture of american gothic and the caption which is cross stitch really big at the bottom says uh uh keep out of oregon <laughs> and it's an allusion to tom mccall's visit but don't stay um at the time and my family always gets a kick out of that um that's great <laughs> yeah uh well that's brent great. i really appreciate you taking the time to to walk down memory lane with the a book that you wrote early in your career which um i will say i give a copy of this book to all of my staff members uh fire at eden's gate because i think it does it is sort of like an oregon autobiography or at least that period of oregon so thank you for writing it and thank you for sit taking some time to chat with me about it um i really appreciate you coming on the podcast you're very welcome i i enjoyed it quite a bit awesome thanks listeners thanks so much for listening and uh, we'll see you back here next week